So when scholars come to this text, uh, the Gospel of John, one of the things that they recognize about this particular gospel is that it's written in stages, at least two stages. So there's kind of like a first edition and then a revised edition, okay? What I'd like to do is show you how the first edition started. That is, when the writer's writing the gospel, this is how the gospel starts. And you will notice it's virtually identical to the way the gospel of Mark starts. So what I'd like somebody to do is I would like somebody to please read um, verses 6. Let's see, verse 6. Seven and eight, and then skip down and read verse 15, and then read verse 19. So you're going to, somebody will read verses six, seven, eight, 15, and 19 in that order. Okay. Nineteen. Now this was John's testimony to the Jews in Jerusalem, saying that his son was about to ask him who he was. He did not clearly confess, but confessed the Lord by the name of the Christ. Okay. This beginning, this is prose, and this is this is the text. You'll notice it's John the Baptist. How does the Gospel of Mark start? John the Baptist, Gospel of Luke, John the Baptist. Matthew, John the Baptist, Book of Acts. You want to be a disciple? You've got to be a disciple first of John the Baptist. So this, this writer is also going to start with John the Baptist. And it is in prose form, <clears throat> as is Mark, Matthew, and Luke when they talk about Jesus. But in the second edition, this writer has taken this concept of light and done some reflecting on the primary biblical text about light. What text is that? There you go. All you have to do is start, stop right there. Are there any other allusions to Genesis 1 in the first five verses of this text? Do you see any words that you think come from Genesis 1? In the beginning. God appear in Genesis 1? Does God speak? And instead of the verb to speak, we, we have the noun word. What else? What else do you have? <coughs> Things that were made or created. Yep. Darkness and light. Mm -hmm. If this is a reflection on the Genesis creation narrative. That's what this, the beginning of this hymn is. It's a reflection on the Genesis creation narrative. And it's saying, this is creation with Jesus as the real creation, the authentic creation, the new creation. It's not that this is not real. It's, it, remember the other language of Paul, all things are made through him. Do you have that language here in this hymn? Oh, imagine that. Imagine this. What is it that the Christians sing about consistently over and over and over again? All things were made through Jesus, in Jesus, for Jesus. <clears throat> right? Isn't that interesting? Now, how many Christian hymns or songs can you think of today that stress that? They don't. Mm -mm. It's, all, it's all Jesus is my boyfriend stuff or... Very bad sacrificial hymns <laughs> from the 19th century. So let's walk this text. First, the first, I'm sorry, the last word of each line will become the first word of the next line. Now your translations aren't going to reflect this, so I'm going to give you a literal one. 
in the beginning was the logos, and I'm going to leave logos untranslated for now because it doesn't it it, it can mean w o r d word, but it it's something else entirely. I'll get to that in a moment. It's much more than that. <clears throat> in the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and God was the logos. The logos was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made. That which came into being in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Do you see how he picks up the keyword at the end of the sentence and starts the next one with it and just moves forward? Boom, 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 boom. Then you get verse 6. He's imported now the beginning of the narrative that he had originally. And after verses 6, 7, and 8, when he's, he's got John the Baptist saying, I'm not the light, I've come to bear witness to the light, now he's going to come back to the hymn. You'll notice verse 9, pick it up following verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. He was the true light. See that? Which enlightens, there's your verb, Just a few who choose to be saved, no, to who the elect, no, no. Again, what's the verb, what's the noun here? Panta, all, all, all. Again, uh, I'm in verse 9, which enlightens all. Yeah, yeah. Every man or all persons, all persons. There's that universalism again, isn't it? Which enlightens every person coming into the world. He, in the world he was, and the world was made through him. Do we have, that's a repeat now, coming back up to verse 3, isn't it? But you'll notice this time, in, in, in verse 3 it says, all things through him were made, and now he's going to use the term cosmos, the cosmos. Because cosmos for this author doesn't refer to the physical universe. It's a term he's going to use to refer to the matrix. It's, the, it's what we're in. It's the matrix. For God so loved the people in the matrix. I mean, cosmos, <clears throat> excuse me, and logos belong together in Greek philosophy. And this author, even though he's Jewish, reflecting on a Jewish text, is going to also, he's also addressing Greeks. And so he's going to engage their philosophical tradition in this prologue as well as the Jews' philosophical tradition in this prologue. And it's sheer genius. So here's how he does this. In Greek philosophy, the logos was the structuring principle of reality. Logos means structuring principle of reality. That which, as the Colossians hymn puts it, holds all things together. That which gives reason and order to the universe. Logos is a, is a rational concept. So this author is going to use the term logos. Now, prior to Socrates, uh, there was a particular philosopher named Heraclitus. And Heraclitus was the guy you might remember who said you can't step into the same river twice because everything's always changing. Okay, you may have heard that. Well, Heraclitus was the father of Greek philosophy. And he's the first one that said the universe is structured by a a principle, a a, a reality. And it's the logos. And he said, but what is the Logos? And as Heraclitus looked around, he said, the Logos is palemos, or war, conflict. It is conflict that we see everywhere. That's all we see in the, in, 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 is conflict. And that's what structures reality. For this author, that's w- the problem with the cosmos, is it's structured on conflict. Well, does that... Are we working with our theme now of violence and nonviolence? Absolutely. It permeates the text. So, the logos is the structuring principle of reality. In Greek philosophy, it's violent. God's word, when God speaks in the Hebrew scriptures, is often violent. Go kill, go do this. Do you have any violence here in John chapter? Now, listen, this is a trick question, people. Do you have any violence here in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18? And don't think of just physical violence. Think of things like marginalization and stuff. 
What is it? What verse? What's it say? Okay, how's that violence? No, 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 that's not, that's, come on, Will. <laughs> We're going to come to that in a moment. That, no, no, what I want you to do, go ahead. That's right. So ask yourself this question. Humans, as they're evolving, create this thing called religion, and all the gods they make are violent. If you are a nonviolent, loving creator of the universe, how in the world do you let people know that? How do you do it? Because violent gods protect. Violent gods rescue. Viol you know what I mean? Violent gods are on our side. My, if you, know, you hit me, my daddy's going to beat your big brother up kind of thing. How does a nonviolent god come into a world structured on violence, bringing a principle of nonviolence, how does this God do that? What's the only way it can be done? So let me ask you this. When it comes to think in terms of mobs, when a mob agrees, when a group of people agree that someone's the problem, it could be Uncle Bob in the family system, it could be the pastor in a church, it could be the president of the United States, it could be anybody that we think is the problem, and if we can just get rid of the problem, we'll be fine. You with me on this? <clears throat> the nonviolent God only has one of two places to enter this mechanism of religion we've created. On the side of the crowd that believes in a violent God. Or on the side of the victim who takes the violence of the crowd. Well, there's only one of two ways. Either God agrees with the crowd that the victim is guilty, and that's what all the gods of mythology do. Whenever somebody dies in a myth, it's justified. They deserved it. They did this and this and this, and they deserved to die. And the Bible is the first book to open up the possibility that the victim was innocent. So you have a founding murder myth in Genesis chapter 4, Cain and Abel. It's identical to founding murder myths found in other cultures. The Enuma Elish in Babylon, the founding of the city of Rome in Livy, where you have Romulus and Remus, Cain and Abel, I mean Tiamat and Marduk. You, you have all of these myths about where creation came from, and they all come out of conflict, and Heraclitus was exactly right about this. But in all of these myths, the victim is always guilty when the story is told. They deserve to die. But when Cain and Abel's narrative is produced, you'll notice that Abel has a voice. Right? That's the first time in human history the victim speaks. That myth right there. Now, <clears throat> the problem is what the victim speaks. What does the victim Abel speak? What's his blood speak? What does God say? Your, your brother's blood is crying out from the ground for justice or vengeance or whatever you want to say, right? Now, that's very, 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 very different than the orientation Jesus has when he's being tortured and crucified, isn't it? Very different. So my favorite text, and one of my favorite texts in the New Testament is Hebrews 12, 24. The blood of Jesus speaks a better word than that of Abel. There are three ways, and only three ways, to be a victim. So first, you're either part of the mob. You can be part, most people are part of the mob, okay? And they have a victim. The first type of victim is the victim of myth. When Mythology, when mythology is, is being uh, put together in the oral tradition and then eventually it's written down. What will happen is that the story is told in such a way that the victim agrees with the community they are the ones to blame. Okay, We see this in the Oedipus Rex cycle. So the story of Oedipus Rex, you know, he uh, somebody has killed uh, the king, his father, somebody, uh, he ends up marrying his mother unknowingly and... Um, how you can do that, I don't know, but it happens. Um, and of course, um, he says in, in the, the play Oedipus Rex by Sophocles, I heard that a mob killed the king. So there's this rumor. You see what I'm saying? That it's a mob, a turba. But when it comes time, when it comes down to it, and the, the blind uh, poet 
I think it's Tiresias, is accusing him of being the killer. He goes, you're right, I must have done it. I must have done it. I don't remember, but I must have done it. And he blinds himself with two sticks and, and is led out of the city, and he goes into exile blind. In other words, he buys the belief of the community that he's guilty. We see the same phenomenon in children that are abused. When children are abused or a spouse is abused, and the police come, and they say to the child or the spouse, what's happening, what's in there, they're talking, inevitably the child or the spouse will say, if I, didn't, if I hadn't done this or this or this, then daddy or my husband wouldn't have gotten mad. In other words, they are buying into the myth that it's their fault. Been, right? This is the victim of myth. When we take the community's perception of who we are into ourselves and believe it, this is also what causes the phenomenon in the Bible known as demonic possession. Because you're taking the, the voices of a mob that hates, that kills, right? And you're taking that in as your own voice. So you become self-destructive. You remember the garrison demoniac in the cemeteries and he's cutting himself, you know, and he's just self-sabotaging. And when Jesus frees him from that, what, is the, what do the, does the community say? You gotta get out of here, Jesus. You, you've, you've destroyed everything that, that we are as a community. We needed him. We needed him in the cemetery, cutting himself so that we could be up on the hill going, at least we're not that. He's our scapegoat. He functions at least, it creates the us-them binary. At least we're not that. <clears throat> the only way God can enter this mechanism is as a victim, but if God enters the, the, the mechanism as a victim of myth, then God's going to say, oh, the humans are right, I'm responsible, I, I screwed up. Well, we don't have that, do we? Then there's the innocent but retributive victim. That is, they're, the, what's happened to them is unjust. Their voice is heard, but they bring in an economy of exchange, tit for tat, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Now, in the biblical narrative, after Cain kills Abel and God kills Cain, what's next? In the biblical narrative, after Cain kills Abel and God kills Abel, uh, after Cain kills Abel and God kills Cain, what's next? Oh yeah, but I just tricked you again. God doesn't kill. Yeah, that's right. He doesn't kill Cain, does he? What does he do to Cain? Right, put a mark on him. And what does that mark say? Whatever it's, whatever the mark is, what does it say? No, don't touch me, or there will be sevenfold vengeance. In other words, you have God recognizing that even though Cain is a murderer, and even though Abel's blood cries out for justice, the answer, it will, the, the solution will not be found in killing Cain. You have to stop the violence. So the violence is stopped in this text by saying Cain has a mark. And if somebody kills him, his tribe will come back sevenfold on you. You see this? It has nothing to do with God. It's to do with tribal identities. Now, just a bit later before Noah, there's another interesting story. And there's a guy who's like the grandson of Cain who comes along and says... Um, and by the way, it says all mythology, not literal people, not literal grandsons. I'm just working the, the text as it stands. Guy comes along and he says, you know what? I'm a big, bad dude. And a little boy just came up and scratched my arm, and I cut his throat. And if anybody tries to hurt me, my tribe's coming back with 70-fold vengeance. 70-fold. Right? You kill me, my people come back and wipe out your tribe. Seven. Vengeance. Seventy. Vengeance. Do you have any sayings in the Jesus tradition that use seven and seven? It's a direct reference back to this text. Vengeance escalates out of control. Therefore, forgiveness must escalate out of control. I don't know if you if this is even when I first saw this, it was like, like this is crazy. You know, because like 
I don't know. I don't know how it is. You know, we're all in significant relationships, and somebody does something to you once, and it's like, no, no worries. You know, like the waiter, no worries. They do it again. It's just like, <clears throat> you know, third time in a day, it's like, you know, I've asked you twice not to do this, honey. Please, what do you? You know, fourth time, it's like, you're not listening to me. You don't care about me. You're not loving. You know what I mean? Fifth time, forget about it. <laughs> Leave the house. You know, even seven times is so hard for us in a day. Never mind that they wake up the next day and do it. You know what I mean? But to think about 70 times 7 in a day, that means that you simply cannot ever carry a grudge. You just can't do it. 70 times. It's a direct reference back to the 6. So you have violence as the presenting issue. What is the problem with the human being? The human being is the creature that grasps the object of desire is willing to kill for it in order to build a civilization. Remember, it says Cain went out and built a city complete with Walmarts and CVSs and the Las Vegas Strip, you know, and then he waited like 10,000 years for enough people to come and play. He went out and built a city. This is a myth. It's trying to signal to you that civilization and death belong together. As in all mythologies, all civilization is grounded in the death of someone. All civ American civilization is in the death of British soldiers, Native American Indians, African American slaves, women, children. I, what do I got to do, you know? We depend on death to be a culture. The church depends on death. We need our scapegoats. That's why, you know... We get a pastor in, things are going bad. Who's the problem? The pastor. We'll get a new pastor. The new pastor comes in, things go to pieces. What's the problem? The pastor. We'll get a new pastor. It's never about us. It's never about us. It's always about the person that's causing the problem. So, the victim of myth agrees. The biblical victim in travail acknowledge, is able to speak about their innocence. They didn't deserve this, but they're still seeking retribution. And we hear that voice in the news all over the place. In fact, we hear both voices in the news if we pay attention, but these two voices are in the news. The third voice is that of Jesus who forgives, the forgiving victim. Jesus' blood speaks a better word than that of Abel's. That's the only way the father could enter the mechanism. He can't enter it as the victim of myth. He can't enter it as the persecuting crowd. God can't enter it or she can't enter it as Abel. The only way to come into this mechanism and absolutely just put a cog in the machine so it no longer works is to say, well, I forgive everybody and everything, and um, that's going to be our reboot. And the fact is we don't want to hear that. We need our Adolf Hitlers and our Donald Trumps and our Dick Cheneys and everybody else to go to hell. We need, the, you know, the bitter neighbor, the bad boss, the horrid wife. The well, We need them all to go to hell. We need a hell. And for us to be able to look at human history as totally forgiven by God means, A, that nobody can sin against us. I need you to hear this. Nobody can sin against us. So, I, you know, when, when my meal was messed up, <clears throat> you saw me get like, you're right. Okay, first I'm watching it over there, right? Mistake number one, it's sitting under the heat lamp. Okay, mistake number one. Mistake number two, incorrect order. Mistake number three, no Parmesan, no, no, with pasta on the table. Mistake number four, you ladybug in your salad. Right? We, you know, it's just like, okay, there's all these errors. It would have been so easy to say, comp the bill. We're going to call the boss. You know, do, do, But I knew what I was going to do from the beginning, which is what I always do, and that's, ream the guy an asshole, and then tip him really well and say, look, man, I understand, been there, done that, I know about bad days on the job, but this was one table that you really messed up on. I guarantee you every other table gets served in there today is going to get great service. He's on his toes now because we showed him some mercy and you know what I mean? Had we been the bad customer and just bitched and complained and whined, we're not paying, da 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 we'd have left, and all he would have been able to do is say, Pfft. He would have never learned anything with me. But, but you know, with your generosity and the tip, pff, did he ever get that lesson? You betcha. And then he shared with us his own story. You know what I mean? It's like, I've been there. I get it. You see, he, he's identifying. So we create this um, solidarity, I guess, is the best word, around grace. So this is what the gospel's doing. 
God comes into our religious mechanism as our victim. We kill him. We all kill him. When the African-American spiritual says, were you there when they crucified my Lord? You know, we do the pious thing. Were you there when they, oh yeah, Jesus, oh yeah, were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Oh, Jesus. We don't see ourselves as the nailers, the beaters, the people with the cat of nine tails and the hooks on the end. We don't, and that's how we're invited to enter the narrative. We are not invited to enter the passion narrative as the victim. We are invited to enter the passion narrative and our encounter with God as the persecutor. Because in our time, uh, well, let me get back. Remind me, I need to get back to post-Holocaust victim status. So we're going to talk about that. Prior, we'll get to, to the prologue. I know this is a, a bit of a rabbit trail, but it's really essential to understand what's going on in verse 9 and the rejection that's happening in verse 9. When God enters this mechanism and forgives everything, that's the, that's the end of religion, because religion can't operate with forgiveness. Unconditional forgiveness. It has an economy of exchange. God will forgive you if you ask to be saved. God will forgive you, but if you disobey him, lose your salvation. God will forgive you, and you better listen. So this is just for you guys. Anytime. Anybody does theology, and they make a statement, and they have a condition after they say, God, blank, if. At that point, you know you're not dealing with gospel. Because there's no conditions in the gospel. None. Anytime somebody says, God, blank, but, you know you've got religion. They're, in every in these cases, in every single case, they're importing law or, or sacrificial thinking back into the equation. Yes, God is love, but if you don't accept Him, you're going to burn. You know. Yes, God is love if you're good. You know. There's another word, and that's God blank and, which indicates consequences. Oh, uh, so. Um, God reveals himself in Jesus, and he also reveals himself in, I don't know, uh, ladybugs. You know, anytime you have any other revelation of God outside of Jesus, somebody says, and. Jesus reveals himself in Jesus and in dreams and in this and in that. Anytime you have any of that, anytime you have an and, you've got religion. We are invited to be the only people on the planet that take that put our entire trust in a human being and call that faith. Everything else is religion. Everything else is religion. So who discovered this? Who did this? No, no, who discovered you can't say God blank if or God blank but or God blank and? Who discovered that? Yeah, yeah. Who, in other words, who, who was the theologian that said, if you say God and you put a condition, if, if you say God and you put a but, and, and, you know, then it's not gospel. I'll help you out here. Martin Luther. You see, the, the great figures of the Reformation, including Calvin, by the way, um, have some incredible insights. Can't throw the babies out with the bathwater, ever. Calvinism's an, another issue. Calvinism, it does not represent Calvin. Calvin's theology and Calvinism are two different things. Our tendency is to castigate Calvin because we're trying to blast Calvinism. But Calvin, oh my goodness, there are some places in the, in the institutes where um, Calvin soars like an eagle. I mean, it's just great stuff. Um, do you have a Calvin's institutes? Oh, okay. You will after you give me the flash drive. So this is religion, and there's no ifs, ands, or buts. You'll notice, and this is really, really, really important. When Paul uses but, it's never God at the beginning. It's, here's the problem, but God. 
So if you go to Ephesians chapter 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sins and all the bad things you did. Bah, 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 you were missed, but God! I had a friend of mine preach that as an Easter sermon and he called it God's Big Butt. <laughs> it's true, it's on my website. <gasps> this is how the gospel works. Religion does this. The gospel does this. The emphasis in the gospel is on the character of God. God, not our problem. Our problem is only known as it is passing away. Or, as uh, theologian James Allison says, we only know sin as it's being forgiven. We don't know sin as a thing. We only know it as it's being forgiven because the only thing the Father does with sin is forgive it. So, you'd like James for two reasons. One, he's a... Um, uh, the most incredible uh, theological thinker, a Girardian, and two, he's a gay Catholic priest, and he has stood up against the Vatican, and one sort of, sort of one. I mean, he doesn't have a parish, um, but they haven't taken away his priesthood either, which is really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, James would be a guy that would come to Vegas. He'd have to have some little money, but because he lives in Spain, but he does come to the States frequently. Do you see this? I mean, do you see how religion just simply takes the truth, turns it upside down, inverts it? Well, it's this, what this writer's doing here with the logos. He's taken this Greek philosophical, Jewish philosophical view of the world is structured on reality. I'm sorry, on violence. And he's inverted it. He's saying that the logos of God is nonviolent. Is it not the case in the Gospel of John that Jesus never once bears arms, defends himself, you don't see that in this gospel, do you? You do have texts like, no one takes my life, I lay it down, all over the place. It is this nonviolent logos, this nonviolent new structuring principle of reality coming into an already structured principle of religion and ritual and sacrifice comes right into it takes the place of the sacrificial victim, but completely deconstructs it by refusing, absolutely refusing to participate in either what the community says about being a victim or in being a retaliatory victim. God breaks the mechanism by forgiving. Nobody ever expected that. Nobody. Nobody. And Paul says, if the principalities and powers, the state authorities, or, the, or is it also another term for the dark side, had known what they were doing, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. They would have just left Jesus alone to die of old age, and there might have been followers of his, but there would have been no church. Just would have just petered out after a while. That's what they should have done if they were smart. But they weren't. And they let God come right into the heart of the thing and destroy it. You ever see the movie Tron? Remember the movie Tron? Uh, remember that? He has to get into the heart of the computer system in, in order to pop the virus and, you know. T-R-O-N. It's an old, old movie with Jeff Bridges. It's a silly little cartoonish kind of thing, but that's how it's, God enters right into the heart of this mechanism to, do, to just absolutely shut it down. The effects of that, the effects of that, of this message you can see on Western civilization now, particularly at the end of the 20th century. It has taken us 20 centuries and it took until the Holocaust for humanity to go, oh, we kill people. Look what Hitler did, killed 6 million Jews. That's not good. And then since then, in the 50s, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, into our own millennium, we have seen a growing awareness of how we victimize others. So, you know, you've got your civil rights movement. There's your blacks. You've got the women's suffrage movement. There's your women. You've got child labor laws passed. There's your children. You've got, um, well, I was going to say Native Americans are put on reservations, except they're given the poorest land. Uh, they're still the scapegoats of this country. But do you see what I'm saying, how we do this? So now we have uh, the situation where... Everybody's a victim. Why? Because who gets the attention? The victim. The moment I say, I'm a victim, what's everybody going to do? They're going to jump on my side, aren't they? Right? That is, we form a new mob. 
And if I'm an angry victim, if I want my piece of my pound of flesh, my piece of justice, and I've got people behind me, what are we going to end up doing to secure that justice? We're going to make sure somebody pays. There's your economy of exchange. Problem is we do this in the name of Jesus. And that's the real problem. And that's where the world absolutely looks at us with disgust. We've turned Jesus into an antichrist in modern Christendom. Now, Nietzsche foresaw this shift where everybody and their brother would be a victim and sister would be a victim. And he, and this is already back before the turn of the 20th century, about 15, 20 years before that in the 1880s. And he says, when that happens, Christianity will have ruined the world because Nietzsche believed that a crucified God, a crucified God was a wimp, a weakling, and that what we really needed to believe in was a super God and a super human, the ubermensch, that gods are powerful, gods are bloody, gods kill, we just got to get used to it, and we might as well go out and be as powerful as we can. Of course, that ends up fueling the Nazi uh, ideology, uh, but Nietzsche was right. We have become a planet that has become focused on the victim. With me so far? But in that focus, we're all Abel. A-B-E-L. We're all speaking with the blood of Abel. You do not find Christians speaking with the blood of Jesus. I forgive you. You don't. We're all speaking the blood of Abel, and this is what the world knows intuitively, senses intuitively, and why people are fleeing the church. Because God is not like Abel. God is like Jesus. <clears throat> oh, Carolina. Mm-hmm. Saw it there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They don't. Isn't it fun? The Christians don't get it, right? It's the same with the Amish where we're at. People just could get it. Why would they do that? You know, it's not justice. That's not how we live. We're, we, in, we're, in our culture, we live by what? The rule of law. That's what we claim. We live by the rule of law. Phew. Which means we're all doomed. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and, and to call it a Christian culture and say you live by the rule of law, to me, is like got to be the biggest contradiction in the universe. But that's what the right does. That's right. Right. And so the courtroom is Janus faced, isn't it? Yeah. Mercy. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you, don't know. you don't know what you're getting. Right. 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 You know, I, and I, I thought that way you know, forever because back then as long as you were developing the rule, you know, developing the law and, and trying not to, you know, to your conformity mm -hmm. based upon what the world would want to know. All right. Right. Yeah, isn't it interesting then? It's all kind of like a scheme as to see who can get the judge to think like they do. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I've been right now. Okay, I don't want to. We'll, we'll, we'll save that for another time, my, my observations on American legal system. Um, so in, in this text, in John 1, 1 through 18, let me just see if I can write this out. You have... What we're going to use the technical term midrash, although it's not really a midrash, it is a reflection on Genesis 1. We know that. You can see that in the language, right? It is also a reflection 
on, um, I'm going to, I don't want to say Greek philosophy, I want to say it's a reflection on, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll just put Greek philosophy for now. It's a reflection on the logos of, 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 and, and cosmos of Greek philosophy. So it's both of these at the same time. It is also structured, we saw this, as a hymn. And in that hymn, the writer, if you, if you take verses 6 through 8, 15 out, you'll notice this thing just reads fluently. So, for example, as I pointed out, the end of verse 5, the darkness did not comprehend it. Um, and then you, you pick up again at verse 9, he was the true light that enlightens everything that comes into the cosmos. It just flows. And then you get down to uh, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory as of the only son of a father, full of grace and truth. And then go to 16. For out of his fullness, there's the word full again being repeated, um, uh, we have all received grace upon grace upon grace. You know, so this is the, so you take out those little narrative portions. So it's, it's, it's a hymn that has been built into a prose introduction. I, I don't know if, if you begin to see the genius of this guy, I mean, how much reflecting did it take? to be able to do all this thinking and then craft this beautiful hymn that is really metered beautifully. You see what I'm saying? Um, and it is this hymn, if you take the theology of this hymn, it's this that is um, the solution to the problem in this community where there were those in this community, the, the it, the Johannine community, the community around the gospel and letters of John, not the Apostle Zebedee, that's just what they're called. And it is this community, um, oh, that thought just left my head. i got to get it back because it's important. Um, okay, the, the, the prologue is written to deal with, with the problem of the community, which has to do with those who will not care for the poor in their midst. Because their view is that material reality doesn't matter. So whether you eat or whether you starve, whether you have sex or you're an ascetic, if physical reality doesn't matter. And if I want to save you, why well, we'll do it on a spiritual level, not a physical one. And that's why when you look at the structure, the whole little letter of 1 John, and I, I can uh, get you a copy of this because I've laid it out. <clears throat> 1 John is structured on a pattern known as chiasmus where each section of the letter as you go down through the letter, the beginning like chapters 1, 1 through 4 is paralleled by chapter at the very end by chapters, verse, chapter 5, 18 to 20 and so on and so forth. You have these parallels going all through and this center section which is the heart of the letter is 310. Don't be a murderer like Cain. I mean, it just stands out like a sore thumb as you're moving through the chiasmus. For this author, for this author, if you don't care for the poor in the community, if you're not feeding the, the, them, if all you're doing is ignoring the flesh, because you believe that Jesus did not come in the flesh, he was sort of a spirit being, you know, and he was, you know, you know how people do. He's a spirit. The flesh doesn't matter. Then your ethics are going to reflect that. Your ethics are not going to be concrete. They're not going to be real. And this is the problem. And so, when this author writes this hymn in the prologue, one fourteen, and the word became flesh, is exactly parallel to the problem here that Cain refused to acknowledge the flesh of his brother. You, in other words. In other words, you have a recognition that the, the God that has to come into this mechanism has to be, become absolutely one of us. And if God is one of us, then that means in order to be like one of us, when faced with the mechanism of 50 people surrounding us with stones... Do you have the luxury as a human being of calling lightning down on these mobs? 
then neither could Jesus. Couldn't use his power that way. Couldn't do it. Could have. Could have called 10,000 leaders. But if he did that, he wouldn't be like us. This is amazing to me. We talk about God is like us. God has feelings. We have feelings. Da, da, da. No, no. God is like us precisely by coming into the bottom of our existence and knowing that bottom. That's where God is like us. You know, in other words, God ceased to believe in the gods at the cross. God is not like us. He's not, you know. This is, again, the temptation narrative. Caesarea Philippi, Gethsemane, Mark's gospel structured on these three episodes that are identical where Jesus is not like the violent revolutionaries, the Davidic messiahs everybody's hoping for that will come and wipe out the Romans temptation narrative. Caesarea Philippi Gethsemane, here's Jesus over and over and over again rejecting violence. That's how Mark's gospel is structured. Oh yeah. That was the most popular view. It's not just the Pharisees who thought that. You have the Essenes, or actually the Qumran community, uh, who are connected with the Essene movement. They have two messiahs, one from David, one from the priestly line. And the priestly line guy, he's to be feared, man. He is like really something else. He's, he, it's Melchizedek. He's Melchizedek. And Melchizedek in the Essene tradition is, is coming back with a sword, and he's going to wipe everybody out. That's the Essene tradition, which is why the writer to the Hebrews apparently is writing to these kinds of people and wants to make very, very, very clear that Melchizedek means king of peace. You know, you see, I mean, and he does this whole riff there in chapter 8 or 9 on Melchizedek that is the exact opposite of what you see going on in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Just the exact, he's, he's trying to reframe this view. So, again, the more you can learn about the environment of Jesus, the more, easier it is to get him, or the New Testament writers. Um, so, <clears throat> here's another one. Let's, since we're in the Gospel of John, let's play for a minute. Did I do I'm the way, the truth, and the life with you at dinner the other night when we were talking? It's a good thing Charles isn't here. Because I'm about to exegete the text that every liberal hates. I am the way, the truth, and the life. How is this traditionally interpreted? What's the traditional interpretation? Come on, you all know it. Only way to heaven. How about Muhammad? Buddha? Moses? No, no, no. I am the way... truth, and the life. God, we do all kinds of stuff with that, don't we? We do all kinds of seriously weird devotional stuff. You can, if you so choose, take these two nouns, the truth and the life, and see them as modifying the word way. In other words, I am the living and truthful path or way. You see that? I am the living and truthful path. What is the opposite of living or life? What is the opposite of truth? Is there anybody, is there any time in the Gospel of John, since we're in that Gospel, where Jesus makes a statement and connects death and lie? Where? You are of your father the devil, and he is a liar and a murderer. Op, RK, from the beginning. Ha <laughs> ha, there it is again, right? Genesis 3 and Genesis 4 belong together. We in the West have separated out Genesis 3 and everything else after that is just what it is. We don't really talk much about the Cain and Abel story and these kinds of things, okay? Deception leads to death. The lie of the community, you're the guilty one. We agree, right, Jay? He did it. We, that's our deception. 
and we're going to get rid of him, and that's death. Now, the, the Satan, I'm using it at like this, the small letter S, Satan, meaning the kind of evil dark side, because I don't want to think it, you know, in terms of like the exorcist or something stupid. Um, this devil, who's a liar and a murderer from the beginning, is the exact opposite of the one who brings life and truth. You see this? So when John, when this writer does things, I, I just don't know of any other writer that intentionally plays on words like this writer does. And I'll show you what else he does with words. You want to have some real fun. Um, if I said to you, um, uh, Jay, you've been really, really awesome. I, I am just going to exalt you uh, around the workplace this week as your boss. I'm just going to absolutely exalt you. How do you interpret that phrase, exalt? What does exalt mean? Brag about you. What else could it mean? Put you up on a pedestal. <coughs> Lift you up. So when we say, I exalt the Lord, what are we saying? And where do we exalt the Lord in our singing and our hymns? In our hymns in the Sunday morning, we go, I exalt you, Lord, majesty on high, above all high things I exalt you. You are high and lifted up. Your train fills the temple like you're so high, like there's no air up there. Right? Right? We do that. Now, how about the verb to glorify? Charlene, you have been incredible. I, I am going to glorify you. What does this mean to you? Okay, hey, but I need you to think just like a pagan or a Christian. <laughs> I'm going to glorify you. I'm going. What am I doing? The same as exalting, right? That's right. You're up here, right? It's like, and I say, I glorify you, Lord, or glory to the Lord. We get this idea of splendor, right? Big time splendor. Now, the writer. Do you have this? I can erase it. This is where this writer is so clever by far, that um, when the, I got it, when the scholars say the gospel of John is shallow enough for a child to wade in and deep enough for an elephant to swim in, they're absolutely right. The verb to exalt is hupsao. And the verb to glorify is tuxadzo. And in the Gospel of John, when the writer uses these two verbs, they do not refer to that. This writer says, if I be lifted up if I am exalted, I will draw all men to myself. And that doesn't refer to up there. It refers to being lifted six feet off the ground. And humiliation, abject shame. Uh, Jesus calls that being exalted. And he says the Father will glorify the Son. And it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the cross. That's the Father's glory, is this broken, beaten, bloody, Jewish itinerant preacher being treated as a terrorist on a Roman cross. That's God's glory. This writer's turning everything upside down. So when you run across the verb to exalt or to glorify, you will notice it's with direct reference to the cross every time. In fact, there's nothing in the Gospel of John that is not in allusion to the cross, including every single one of the seven signs. They all point to the cross. And when you get to the cross, the Johannine author has no Pentecost because Jesus breathes the Spirit out of the cross. It's the Spirit of the crucified. That's also, excuse me, that's also Paul. But take the word pneuma, another word with double meanings, it can mean spirit. Wind, 
breath and take the, the, the um, phone, which is voice, sound, it kind of it can be translated in a number of ways. So when, let me read you a text. And just, you know this text by heart, and I'm going to read it in Greek, and you will be able to translate the play on words yourself. Come on, Jesus, what do you say? Uh, okay. The pneuma blows, breathes. The pneuma, the wind, the breath, the spirit, blows, breathes wherever it wills. Lost my place in the text. Where am I? Verse 8. And you hear its phone, its voice, or its sound. But you do not know where it's coming from or where it's going. Now, again, does this author use this language of coming and going with regard to Jesus? Yes, he does. Here it's being used of the Spirit. I come from the Father. I'm going to the Father. You see the wind, but you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. You don't know where I'm coming from. You don't know where I'm going. Where are you going, Lord? You know all this language of coming and going? Anytime you see these, these verbs or nouns repeated, this author's trying to get you to like write them all down and see what he's doing with them. So the wind blows where it wills and you do not know from whence it comes or where it is going. Thus is everyone begotten of the spirit. What the heck? Thus is everyone begotten of the breath, the wind. What is he saying? What is he doing here with all these words with these twisty double meanings or the word night? N-I-G-H-T, in the Gospel of John, can refer to nighttime. It can also refer to night, like darkness, you know. So when John 13, it says, and Judas went out, and it was night. No, it was nighttime. But the, the, the writer, this is nuktos, it's got that double meaning of darkness now. So there's all these wonderful words he uses with double meanings in order to subvert the normal sacrificial meaning of things. Hebrews, John, Mark, we haven't even done Luke yet, Paul. Each one of these writers recognizes exactly the phenomenon we saw happening in Genesis 22 and Jeremiah 7. God is in the process of weaning us from religion and teaching us to follow Jesus so that we can become authentic human community. There is no human community apart from the true human life of Jesus of Nazareth. It, there's social life, but our whole thing is built on death dealing. This isn't. This, this other path. This is the Gospel of John. It's sheer genius. So, Again, each one of these writers is, is singing about this Jesus in their church, who, about this God who comes and invades the world, solves the human predicament. That's the gospel. The gospel is not you're in a predicament, you're still in sin, you got to accept Christ to get out of it and get saved. The gospel is, brother, you're redeemed. End of story. <laughs> You're forgiven. And not only does God forgive you, but I forgive you. Whoa. Now, this is serious Christianity, isn't it? And, of course, it, it, there's a price to be paid. Okay. So we have looked at several texts real, real quick in and around worship in the early church. What have we observed in every single case? One. Creation, redemption, salvation, all things are at God's initiative. I'm going to use the theta for God, God's initiative. Everything starts with God. Two, we've seen that everything God does is about everything. 
and that's that ta panta in the text. All things, all things, everything. Three, other than the Trinitarian hymn of Ephesians 1, which we don't see anything else like in early Christendom. There's nothing like that until you move into about, oh, 100 years later. All the other hymns evidence a big U structure like that we've talked about before. All of them do this. All the hymns that we have seen contrast Jesus with something, whether it is the violent concept of the Logos, in John, B, whether it is Adam in Philippians 2, 2, 5 through 11, John 1, 1 through 18. Um, the Colossians hymn really doesn't have set up Jesus over against anything at, per se, but it does set up Jesus as the um, primary, remember the language of prototokos, he's the firstborn, he's preeminent. It, it is setting him up over against other mediatorial figures. So we'll put other mediatorial figures in Colossians 1, 1 to 15. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Hebrews. 1, 1, and 2, again, Jesus is set over against the ways God revealed God's self. To the Jewish people. Every one of these hymns sets Jesus over against something. That's what they do. Now, if you want to sing about Jesus in the church today and you want to do it according to the apostolic pattern, you're going to have to rewrite just about all the songs. <laughs> with me? Um, and this is the problem with playing church. If we play church, we've got to use the songs they sing, the people know. And my argument is we can't afford to do that any longer. What we need to do is we need to get together and we need to start writing our own non-sacrificial songs and singing them together. They become our story. And we can follow this apostolic pattern. You know, um, all creation and redemption of human sexuality are God's initiative. Why not have songs that, that name gay and straight love as both legitimate forms of love? You see, the hymns, hymns that do this. Hymns that, to get to the top on top, how about hymns that, um, that what God does God does not just for me as a follower of Jesus, but a song says, and God loves the Muslim, and God loves the Jew, and God loves the Hindi, and God loves you. You know, you know what I mean? Why don't we do this? See? So, you know, our hymns need to evidence this downward movement. Again, in total contrast to popular worship, which does the whole whoosh, God is up there thing. High and mighty. And finally... Our hymns need to contrast Jesus with the mediators in our culture. We have, you just think about, for example, evangelicalism. What are its mediators? Well, it's got the government. It's got the Bible. It's got pastors, right? I mean, it's a number. how about the liberal left? Do they need to be, be sure they do. They have mediators as, as well. Their mediators tend to be more intellectual, like a Karl Marx or this or that. That, that. that is the systems that are embedded in their thinking that involve economies of exchange and tit-for-tat thinking. This has to all be addressed, and Jesus is set over against them every single time. Right? I think this is interesting. 
I think this kind of run through the New Testament with these particular hymns opens us up to something that we may or may not have seen before, but perhaps we're seeing more clearly now. And that is the huge contrast between the gospel and Christendom. But it also means this. Christendom is the womb in which the gospel has been carried. So we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And this is, again, what the liberal left wants to do, and it's just not a healthy thing. You can't throw out church history. You can't do it. Uh, there will be a lot. You will, if you, you like to read, so you'll read later this year, starting around the end of summer as we move toward October and the celebration of the Reformation. You will read the right, and they're going to laud Luther's discovery of justification by faith. And then you'll go read the left. Martin Luther was an anti-Semite. And then you read the right. Luther discovered a theology of cross in 1518 in the Heidelberg Theses. Luther was a scoundrel on the left. In other words, this group only knows how to valorize and see no fault. This group only knows how to see fault. And that's just not how life is lived. Because nobody's all wrong and nobody's all right. So my encouragement to people is when you're reading writers or anyone... You have to give them the benefit of the doubt. And, um, and that means reading them through their lens. Now, a good writer is going to do that for you. They're going to walk you into their lens so that you can read from that perspective. Um, uh, you, the, the writer to the Gospel of John is perhaps the most genius at this. And if you go through the Gospel of John, by the way, notice the little aside comments he makes to you as a reader. They're really fun. Each of the Gospel writers, by the way, they do this. They interrupt the flow of the narrative to say, oh, and by the way, let me tell you something. Okay. Um, with this, we have a brand new beginning. We've cleared the slate. We don't throw out Jesus. We don't throw out the Trinity. We don't throw out the work of the Spirit in the church or the world. We don't throw out the Bible. We don't throw out the sacraments. We, you know, we don't throw out even gathering together. All of these things can be done in the Spirit of Jesus. It is not our place to cede to either the right or the left the gospel. It is up to us to call them both to truth and to life, and um, we will take heat from both sides for doing it. But we have to do it. That's the third way. It's the way, I think it's the way of the future. And um, I will end there for now.